still be wild and I can still be crazy and I can still be um, insane and God still chooses to use me. I think where we like make the mistake is we say once you accept Christ, everything gets beautiful and magical and it doesn't, life still happens, I just have a savior to help me through it. Great stuff, isn't it? I love hearing people's stories because it's, it really is evidence and, and uh, the proof that a living God comes into people's lives and it changes them. And Paul talked about this issue of serving in the book of Ephesians. In Ephesians 6, 6, he says, Serve wholeheartedly, actually this is verse 7, as if you were serving the Lord, not men. Because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does. So God calls us, for those of us that would choose to follow Christ, that first and foremost, he calls us to serve, to serve him. And I think the church is one of the vehicles that God gives us to serve it in. And I looked up this word servant. It comes from the Greek word, hupeeretin. So write that down and memorize that, because I'm going to test you later. What this word means is an undertower. And so you've probably seen the old movies like Ben-Hur and stuff, where these guys are in chains and they're rowing the boat together. And the captain is looking forward of where they're going, and the rowers' backs are towards the front, and the only thing they can see is the captain. And as they row together, and they put their backs into it together, then the ship is able to be propelled forward efficiently. If they don't work together, if just half of them are carrying the load, the ship just can't go the way it's built to go. And this is the same picture, I think, of the church. I think one of the weaknesses in the American church is we expect the professionals to do the work. That's what we're paying you to do. But the reality is, when you look at the scriptures here, is God calls all of us to be undertowers of our master who is Jesus. And as we listen to him and follow his lead, we all rode together for the work of the kingdom that God's called us to do. The other thing that the Lord told Paul is a witness. God appointed him as a witness. And what the witness is for is to open people's eyes so that they can move from darkness to light, that they can go from Satan to God. And there's no greater thing, there's nothing more worthy for us to do in our lives than to be a, a servant and a witness for him. Now, witness comes from the Greek word martura, and this is the root word of the word martyr. And so the picture is a witness is someone who literally lays his life down for a cause of something greater than himself or herself. That we choose to follow our captain, to be undertowers, and to be witnesses for him in our world. That's what God called Paul to do, and it's what he's called us as a church to do. And so the question I have is, is who may God be sending you to? Who is someone that your heart's broken for? There are many parents in this room, I know right now, that you have a prodigal child, that there's one or two or maybe more in your family that have wandered very far from God, and your heart breaks for them. Maybe God would call you to serve them and to be a, a living witness to them. Maybe there's someone at work that you know that their life is in disarray and, and in chaos and, and just incredible brokenness in their life, and you know the thing that they need more than anything is Jesus, and maybe God's placed you there right next to them, and you work with them eight to ten hours a day, and God wants you to serve him or her and be a witness. Maybe it's your neighbor, but the point is, is when we as a church in concert together, choose to be a servant and a witness to Christ through the church, I think then the church can truly become the church that God created it to be. 
I think that uh, this church has been placed here divinely by God. That 20-something years ago when this church began, he spoke to a small group of people and he gave them a vision to become a church that would truly reach the unreached in the Grand Valley. And as we have come and, and given us a vision statement to encounter God, others, and the world, is we come together on the weekend like this or on Wednesday night to encounter God together. As we worship God, we experience his presence. And Ronnie did a great job of ushering us into the presence of God through worship, right? And, and I hope that's when you come here, you're expecting to meet God in a unique way. We need that. We also need relationships with one another through groups. And through those relationships, we're trained and equipped so that we can go and be servants and witnesses of God. And, and we just need to have that. And if through those relationships, we can pastor others and be pastored when we need it. But God calls us to go and encounter the world. And as this church has been divinely placed here, and the church has gone through some ups and downs, it's, it's had its bumps and bruises, but I think God wants to bring healing in the church, he wants to restore vision in the church, and he wants this church to go and do what he placed it here to do. But the only way we can do that is if we all join in. It's not going to happen with just the staff. It's not going to happen with only 10% of those in the church that would choose to serve. It's got to happen with a high percentage of us jumping in and saying, God, I'm yours. And as we've been going through the book of Acts here, that, that is truly what I've been desiring and praying for for these last two years that we've been going through the book of Acts is that you see that God calls us to be a missional people. He calls us to go into the world. This isn't just about us. It's about him. It's about his kingdom. And when we as a church corporately say, okay, God, we're yours. We come to serve you and we come to be your witnesses. If we do that together, I believe we can see revival in the Grand Valley because this church is that significant. You understand what I'm saying? So I, I think this is a holy thing that God's calling us to. And what I'm talking about is where I mentioned last week and I sent out an email this week, I believe that God has positioned us for this time to call us into a 40 days of fasting and prayer. I look at what Paul said in Acts 26, 22. He says, but I have had God's help to this very day, and so I stand and testify to small and great alike. And when we fast and pray, I think God gives us the anointing and the, uh, I think the opportunities to preach his good news to great and small alike. And thank goodness that God preaches to the small because I wouldn't be here. <laughs> but look at the issues our world is facing today of a global economy that's in disarray, a threat of, uh, of attacks from uh, zealous uh, terrorists, and, and we, we just can hear all this news, and, and it can give us uh, a sense of unsettledness and in anxiety, but, but the reality is, is God is in control. But what would happen if a church took to heart the calling that God is giving to seek him earnestly for 40 days? What would happen if we did that? Why in the world would God do that? One of our elders, and, and this is one thing I want to share about this, is um, I have been kind of stewing over this for me personally and wondering if God was calling me to do this, that there seems to be seasons that he calls us to do crazy and wild things, right? And I've been wondering, it, God, are you calling us as a church to this? So Glenn Brown, one of our elders, the one, the circumcised guy that you saw on the video, he he came to me and he says, hey, I want to tell you about something that happened. This was a couple weeks ago. 
And he said, I, had, uh, I woke up in the middle of the night and I started to pray and God gave me a vision, a real clear, vivid vision. And he said he saw this A-frame church, a real elaborate A-frame church. And there was flames on the roof of the church and the flames were starting to go up the roof. And so he prayed, God, what is that? What does that mean? And he prayed over that for a couple of days. And then at two days later, he said the Lord revealed to him that the Lord said, I'm going to burn religion out of the church. And it's only through religion being burned out of the church that we can truly be the church. And he said that the Lord gave him 2 Chronicles 7, 14. And this is a common verse for any kind of prayer movement. And the scripture says, if my people, so there we have the question, if my people. And that question I'm throwing out to all of us, if we as his people would seek him. He says, my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then, he says, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. What a great promise. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. And so what I have experienced, I've done a 40-day fast three times in the past 13 years. What I've experienced is when the Lord speaks to me, say it's time to do this, and I actually do it in obedience, my spiritual ears open up, and I hear and see things that God speaks to me. And so some of you are saying, well, where does this come from, this whole thing of fasting? This is just crazy talk. But the reality is, you may not know this, it's biblical. Did you know that there's fasting in the book? You read the book, and there's people all over it that spend time fasting and seeking after God earnestly. Joel 1.14, the Lord says through him, declare a holy fast. Call a sacred assembly. This is basically what I'm doing right now. Summon the elders, listen to this, and all who live in the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. You see, it's not just for the leaders. There are times when the leaders should do this together. But I think there is a time where God's saying, all the people, I'm calling all of you to seek my face earnestly and wholeheartedly. And if we do that for a concerted effort, very intentionally for 40 days, I think you will experience a changed life. And I can say that with certainty because God promises it. So God calls us to repentance, sometimes to repent, sometimes to clear out the crud in our life. Some of us, as Glenn was sharing, have these issues that we just can't get rid of. Sometimes when we fast and pray and seek God earnestly, God brings healing in our hearts. Jesus fasted. Did you know that? In Matthew 4, after he was baptized, it says when Jesus was led by who? The Spirit. And so that's why I never fast unless I really sense the Holy Spirit is calling me to do it because I can't do it on my own. Called him into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. That is an understatement. Now, God uses fasting at times to prepare us, to anoint us for him sending us to do something. It's, it's like, okay, God, I, I'm going to seek you during this time and what you're sending me into. And so... I just want to share a story of, of how fasting impacted my life. When, in 97, we went to Anaheim to the Vineyard Leadership Conference to see if God would speak to us about planting a church in Canyon City. And while they were there, they, the speakers were talking about this book that came out right before then. It was Bill Bright's uh, book called The Coming Revival. And they were talking about uh, the Lord was calling the people.